Live from Boston, I'm Emilio Madrigal. Today we are happy to once again host Dr. Lester Thompson, who will be tackling the salivary, uh, the salivary glands in his presentation titled, Who Keeps Changing the Names of Salivary Gland Tumors? Live from California. You're encouraged to ask questions by typing them as comments right here in the Facebook Live and the YouTube watch windows. And uh, I'll make sure to pass those questions along at the end of the session to Dr. Thompson. So with that, live well, from Boston, I'm Emilio sure. Madrigal. Today so we are happy to over to once again Dr. host Dr. Thompson. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure again for me to be able to uh, participate as one of the members of PASCOFT. I find it to be a really super opportunity for individuals around the world to kind of get an opportunity to listen to some live CMEs. And um, it's a treat for me to be able to participate in this. As you know, um, Head and Neck Pass is the Twitter handle for me. Um, and of course, we do have a Facebook page that has Head and Neck Pass as well as its designation, uh, primarily related to opportunities from the Head and Neck Pathology Journal, which as you know, I'm one of the co-editors for, and is a great opportunity to share things around Head and Neck Pathology. So um, with that, let me start the lecture about who keeps changing names and salivary gland tumors. And really, in essence, I'm going to try and give you a little bit of an update around what happened with the new World Health Organization classification that came out uh, just last year in 2017. And so with that in mind, you know, um, it's always nice to kind of put things in context. And so when I was doing a recent review of um, the incidence of carcinoma and cancer statistics here in the United States, um, you will notice, of course, that the highest number of tumors is related to breast cancer. And then you drop down through the system. And in fact, um, you really have to search hard in order to be able to find the salary gland tumors. And you'll notice there the estimated new number of cases is about 6,500 with about 2,600 deaths a year from the salivary gland related neoplasia. So you can tell that in context, it really is something where there are a limited number of cases, although there seem to be um, a whole host of different diagnoses, and that's what we'll uh, go over a little bit this morning. As you can see over the last several decades, um, there has been an improvement in the overall relative survival for the five-year statistics. You can tell going from the mid-50s in 1975 to nearly 70% now for the most recent data that goes through 2014, and that's the five-year survival starting in 2009. So really, um, it is something where there's not a whole lot of new cases. In other words, the incidence per number of 100,000 people has remained somewhat stable over time, which just means, you know, we don't really know what causes the cancer and therefore you aren't able to prevent it per se. Um, and likewise, the number of deaths has remained relatively um, stable or a slight decline over that particular time frame. So part of this is because really it re represents so much less than 1% of all of the tumors. Um, it is something that tends to occur most commonly um, in adult patients. And um, the frequency, of course, changes a little bit with time. In fact, there has been an increase in uh, female patients uh, presenting with Warfarin tumor over the years. And as you know, one of the primary reasons for this is um, strongly associated with tobacco use and cigarette smoking specifically. And as uh, women have increased their tobacco consumption, so they have had an increase in Warfarin tumor as well. As you know, fine needle aspiration is really still the first line of therapy for these particular um, cases where everyone sticks a needle in right away to try and get an idea of what type of tumor they're dealing with. But still, little is really known about the etiology um, at this particular juncture. Also, molecular techniques um, have been relatively slow to catch on in this particular case. I'm just going to highlight a few of the genetics here in the very beginning of the talk, um, just to show that you know there is kind of a genuinely known molecular alteration with all of the common uh, tumor types that you come across, pleomorphic adenoma with PLAG1 and HMGA2, adenoid cystic with MIB and NFIB, certainly with mucoepidermoid carcinoma, the CRTC1 mammal 2 is uh, definitely well developed and well recognized. Um, although it is not actually grade specific, there was an initial uh, thought that it was present much more commonly in low-grade tumors, but this is now not the case. And then, of course, secretory carcinoma with ETV6 and NTREC, and then finally, the EWSR1 AF, uh, ATF1 for clear cell carcinoma, um, and this is something that is now well recognized. But still, not a lot of information when you consider the total number of tumors that we come across. So, you know, here is um, the World Health Organization classification group. Um, 
first of all, if you look at the date at the top, you will notice it's from 2003. So um, you may say, wait, wait, didn't you just say you were going to do the current system? And yeah, you know, I would like to, but it's always nice to kind of put things in context. And so, you know, here I was in the front row. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if you now put this into um, the meeting we just had in 2016, you will notice it didn't really change position, right? I mean, we went inside, but I'm still standing in the same place. So the reason for this is, yes, there has been change in salivary gland tumor classification, but there aren't that many new lesions to worry about. And so if you look at the overall number of diagnoses for salivary gland tumors, between the 2005 with 42 diagnoses and 2017 with 45, um, it really is not something where there has been a remarkable increase in the number of entities. So this is a snapshot of the various tumor types that are um, included in the new classification, um, and specifically secretory carcinoma, polymorphous adenocarcinoma, and introductal carcinoma are sort of the newer kids on the block for this particular um, cycle. So the inclusion criteria and why there wasn't a rem remarkable change in the number of tumor types is um, for inclusion in the chapter, it needed to be a tumor that occurred exclusively at that particular site. It may have occurred in other sites, but of course had a predilection to develop in the salivary glands, or specifically there was a very a significant uh, consideration given around the differential diagnostic considerations. So um, overall, an entity is really presented in the book only once where it is of major consideration. So mucoepidermoid carcinoma or acinic cell carcinoma is gonna pre be presented in the salivary gland chapter, even though it certainly can occur anywhere else in the upper area digestive tract, there's just not a repetition of that particular finding in each of the various chapters. So when you look at the book, um, just be aware that um, these tumors certainly, especially in minor salivary gland sites, can develop, and yet they may not be included because they're being included only once in um, the salivary gland chapter. So let me talk a little bit about um, tumor site distribution, because I think this is one of the most important considerations for you. And I am definitely not saying that you can practice pathology um, by statistics only. But let me assure you that I think if you know the statistics, you can really like um, dissipate a lot of the anxiety that everyone feels around this particular diagnostic terminology. And so if you think about it, the parotid gland and the submandibular gland, between those two, you've accounted for nearly 80% of all neoplasia. So if you think about that, that means the major salivary glands really do account for the vast majority of the tumors. With that 20% remaining being in the minor salivary glands, and then when you look at the minor salivary gland distribution, again, you have this remarkable majority occurring in the palate. And so um, when you think about where these tumors develop and how they develop, this is a very important consideration. Now, if you flip this to diagnostic considerations um, for you, and here you can tell um, I'm putting in what are the major tumor types. So again, pleomorphic adenoma, accounting for nearly 70% of all of the tumors um, in salivary gland distribution. So if you're going to think about what a diagnosis is in salivary gland pathology, I try to convince myself why it is or is not a pleomorphic adenoma before I go and think about other things. Now, pleomorphic, right, this tells you it's going to have a whole boatload of different patterns and a whole boatload of different appearances and so forth, which is why it is something that you probably need to have considered in every single case. And so if you get into the habit of doing that, I think that um, you'll go a long way to reaching the correct diagnosis in many instances, because it's more of kind of a diagnosis of exclusion um, and a diagnosis of inclusion when you're getting to the end. But if you think about it in these particular terms. So what this actually tells me, though, as far as major distribution distribution is nearly 80% of tumors in salivary gland are benign. So again, um, eight out of every 10 cases you're going to get is a benign ne uh, neoplasm, and only two out of every 10 are going to be a malignant one. This is in major salivary gland distribution. However, when you go to minor salivary glands, you will notice that still pleomorphic adenoma is the single most common neoplasm, but it does not reach a majority. So in this particular case, when you're in a minor salivary gland, nearly 50% of the tumors are accounted for by malignancies. And so this really tells me again that depending
depending upon where I am anatomic site wise is going to be a slight difference in approach to what it is that I really need to include or exclude as my diagnostic consideration. So as a general rule, the smaller the involved salivary gland, the more likely the possibility that it's going to be a malignant tumor. And so if, I, if you think about that as you approach these lesions, um, I think you will have a little bit of an easier time as well. And I'm not going to go into each of these things in great detail, but just know that things like how quickly the tumor developed and how quickly it presented clinically, what the relationship is with the surrounding structures, whether it's, you know, circumscribed or encapsulated or infiltrative or there's bone destruction or perineural involvement, and of course, cytologic atypia. Now, unfortunately, some of these things um, do overlap between the benign and the malignant category. And so I'll show just a core needle biopsy here. And, you know, I think um, even on this core needle, you can tell that there is um, minor salivary gland tissue over here. There is some fibrous connective tissue and inflammation. But then I think you can all tell that there is a neoplastic proliferation that has been included in the sample. And even at this uh, intermediate power, I think the cribriform appearance of it with the slight separation artifact from the surrounding stroma gives you an idea that you're dealing with an adenoid cystic carcinoma. But I always like to put this in the context of where is it from and what am I looking at? And so if you were to look at that as the image where this tumor is coming from. <laughs> Clearly, this is not going to be a benign lesion when this is the extent of the lesion uh, radiographically. So again, um, try to use all of the parameters that are available to you as you come up with your diagnostic criteria for these particular tumors. So I'm going to start off with um, a senic cell carcinoma. It is not because this is a new tumor. However, whenever you talk about the new tumors, if you don't know enough about where they're being pulled from or what they're coming out of, uh, the context of how you're going to be able to come up with an accurate diagnosis is obviously going to be a challenge. So um, a senic cell carcinoma, secretory tumor, about 6% of all salivary glands, about 10 or 12% of all malignant salivary gland tumors, like female predilection, and usually in the fifth decade of life as a slowly growing mass. Here you can see um, a mass present um, in the parotid gland of this particular patient um, on either view, and you can tell it isn't red, it isn't erythematous. It's obviously something that has taken some time to develop in this particular case. So nearly 95% of these tumors develop in the parotid gland, and of course this is because they're arising from serous type asini, and that is the location that has the most of them. Now, we used to say that the minor salivary gland was the second most common site, but I really think that nowadays with secretory carcinoma and polymorphous adenocarcinoma, whether it is of the low-grade or cribriform pattern type, those are now probably more likely to be in the minor salivary gland locations, and therefore a cynic probably is really a major salivary gland type um, tumor. So you really need to think carefully whenever you have that particular lesion. It's also the most common of the bilateral salivary gland malignancies, although of course uh, between Warfarin and pleomorphic adenoma, they're much more commonly identified in a bilateral appearance. So usually circumscribed, occasionally ill-defined, uh, not usually encapsulated, lobular cut surface, solid to cystic with hemorrhagic appearance. Uh, here you can see an area that is much more um, solid in this particular tumor as a gross presentation of it. So you'll notice that there's a lymph node present out here at the periphery, and then a fairly well circumscribed uh, tumor. You can tell that there's some fibrous connective tissue, so sometimes they are partially encapsulated as a separation from the surrounding parenchyma. What I think you can see, even at this very low power, is the fact that it is just remarkably blue, right? So sometimes the term blue dot tumor is utilized for this, and this is because it looks like um, serous acinar differentiation, because that's exactly where it's arising from, and this is why it gives you a very nice blue appearance. Another example here, just, you know, a great blue appearance to it, multi-nodularity to it as it extends out and expands into the um, adjacent parenchyma. Now, when you think about where it is overlying the um, region of the um, salivary gland, um, it obviously is at the angle of the jaw, and so if you think of about the angle of the jaw and what is going on with that particular lesion as well. Um, clearly, this is where uh, you can have bone invasion develop. And so I'm showing an example here of a very uh, bland appearing tumor, and yet it still is within the interstices of bone in this particular case. So there's usually one dominant um, pattern, either solid microcystic papillary or follicular. Um, actually, with the uh, papillary cystic appearance being much more commonly identified in secretory carcinoma, again, this is something where you need to think a little bit more carefully about the tumor. But in general, um, a dominant pattern is found, even though multiple other patterns um, may be present at that particular time as well. 
So um, it frequently invades into the surrounding appearance, solid or nodular pattern, um, small spaces, large cystic areas or follicular pattern, the blue dot being the solid, the small spaces or lattice-like appearance or sieve-like appearance. And then, of course, these papillary structures look like very complex papillae that often have a hobnailing or tomb uh, stone type appearance. And then finally, the follicular pattern really looks like thyroid follicular epithelium with proteinaceous material present within it. So this is a classic appearance for a cynic where you can see multiple blue dot uh, appearance when you go to a different area. This is more of a sieve-like pattern um, where you have open uh, spaces, sometimes filled in with secre uh, secretory type material as well. A little bit more of a papillary architecture here, giving multiple papillary projections out into a luminal space that's quite complex. Um, more papillary appearances here, giving you that kind of tombstoning effect um, where you can see these small projections out into the space. And then finally, a follicular pattern where it really does look for all intents and purposes like thyroid, where you have um, an inspissated or colloid type material present um, in the center. So when you think about it, um, even though we call it um, a cynic cell carcinoma and the serous acina cell is by far and away the dominant finding, um, giving you this, you know, very strong resemblance to serous acina cells with kind of, you know, dense gray, blue, purple granules, there are still going to be several other tumor cell types that are part of the neoplasm. So the intercalated duct type cell, the nonspecific glandular cell, which often has kind of an amphiphilic to eosinophilic cytoplasm, clear cells, and then finally the vacuolated cells that are in the background, um, which are actually PAS and UC Carmen negative. So if you think about it, all of these particular cell uh, types are present within the tumor, even though the dominant cell finding is usually of the serous acina group. Now, if you think about it, if you had the nonspecific glandular cells as the dominant finding, you would probably have just called it an adenocarcinoma NOS because you really do need to see areas with secretory granules in order to make the asthenic cell carcinoma classification. So many times, depending on the type of sample that you have, it may be a little bit more challenging to see it. So when we see something like this, so you go to high power and you see all these gorgeous granules that have a nice blue quality to them present in the cytoplasm, it's a very easy diagnostic consideration um, in this particular circumstance. But if you go to an area like this, I think you can still tell they are areas that have acina differentiation with those uh, granules present in the cytoplasm, but they're not just as dominant as they were in the previous setting. And an area like this, you may say, wow, these are all just glandular epithelial cells. How do you know that you're dealing with an asthenic cell tumor? And so this is where looking at multiple fields, certainly if this were just a core needle biopsy and that's all you had, it would be a much more challenging interpretation. Um, the papillary structures can be seen here on higher power where there's a um, very even uh, appearance to the nuclear chromatin distribution, but kind of a hobnail appearance in that papillary appearance. One of the common findings in this particular tumor is, in fact, um, the presentation of lymphoid infiltrate. And it is really a remarkable germinal center formation um, with simulation of a lymph node. And so many times people will actually get confused and say, hey, is this actually um, an example of um, a lymph node and is it metastatic disease or not? And it really is not. So here you can see an example of the serous acina cells over here as part of the asthenic cell carcinoma. Um, a germinal center with a remarkable number of um, inflammatory cells present in the background. Another example here where you can see the serous acina component, not quite one-to-one -one relationship, but definitely very much in, uh, infiltrated and involved with the tumor-associated lymphoid proliferation. So this is a very common finding in asthenic cell carcinoma and does not it should not be misconstrued as evidence of a lymph node because it is just part of a tumor-associated response. And in fact, when the tumor-associated lymphoid proliferation is present, these are the patients who actually have a much better overall outcome um, because there is a host response to it. Sometimes you'll get stromal fibrosis. This is an uncommon finding, although whenever I do see this type of stromal fibrosis, I'm much more concerned about the potential for a high-grade transformation, which is something I'll discuss here in just a few moments. So what can you do to confirm the diagnosis? Well, probably the PAS is really the single most important thing to do in these particular cases um, because it is something that is very helpful and easy to do. Of course, DOG1 and SOX10 are positive while the S100 and mammoglobin would be negative. So here's an example of the PAS with diastase and you can tell that there is actually an accentuation of the granules around the lumen 
So whenever you're looking at this particular study, just be aware that you will have an accentuation of it. And in fact, this is uh, quite similar to what you see with DOG1. When you do DOG1, there's an accentuation of it in a membrane right at the luminal aspect of each of the small asini. So when you think about this as being an asinus, this is the location in which you're actually getting um, a positive reaction with the um, marker. So either one of those two is going to be helpful. Although you can tell, it is really a very delicate reactivity with the DOG1. And so this is not something that you can just look at on low power and interpret. You really do need to go down and look at it on higher power in order to be able to tell what's going on. So the management, usually complete excision, excellent overall prognosis, about 80 to 90 percent, five year, um, 10 years, 65 percent. And of course, in this case, the clinical stage is much more reliable than the histologic grade. Um, you will get recurrences, usually about 35 percent of cases or so within the first five years. However, high-grade transformation is something that can be seen. About 15% or so of the cases will do this, usually only in the parotid gland. Um, much older decade um, at presentation, so truly 20 years older than the conventional um, acinic cell carcinoma. So this tells you that it has taken some time to develop in this particular case. So they usually juxtapose next to each other. You will have these very undifferentiated areas, um, small or large cell appearance to them, or poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma, increased mites, um, tumor necrosis, um, present anaplastic um, appearance to the overall tumor. And these blend around and mix with the area of underlying um, serous asana differentiation. So when you're looking at these particular tumors, if you have a high-grade area, it's really important to look at what is adjacent. So here you can see the area of high-grade. Um, it's kind of arranged in almost a um, rosette-type appearance with comedonecrosis in the upper corner. And yet the area of um, unremarkable cynic is present on the right-hand side of the screen. Another example here, right-hand side showing the cynic differentiation. I think all of you can see the areas of the granules present in the cytoplasm and then the area of transition immediately to the left where you can see the it is taken on a completely different um, nuclear chromatin contour distribution, NC ratio, and looks much more ominous than the surrounding tumor. Likewise here, there is um, a, a cynic in the background in the upper portion of the field and then the central area showing the area of transition to high grade. So often you can see this um, blending and mixing of these particular tumors. One final example where you have the acinic present on the far left-hand side and then the area of transition to a high-grade um, or dedifferentiated. We prefer the term high-grade transformation now to dedifferentiation, um, but of course many times the areas uh, will have lost their usual immunoreactivity profile, and so they will be a bit more challenging to be able to come up with an accurate diagnosis. Here is an example, actually, of a small cell pattern that can be seen as one of the tumor types, and in fact, it was even positive with CK20. As you know, this is sometimes referred to as the Merkel cell variant, um, and it is important, of course, to exclude the chance that um, skin Merkel cell is actually metastasized to the salivary gland, since head and neck locations for Merkel cell tumor are quite common, and the salivary gland has somewhere between 60 to 100 lymph nodes in it, and so it's much more likely to have metastatic disease than to have something that has transformed within it. So now we go to one of the new tumors, the secretory carcinoma. So as you know, it was originally described in 2010 by uh, Dr. Scalover and the rest of her group over in Europe. And so when you think about it, um, ascenic cell carcinoma, when they re-reviewed those cases, about 12% of them turned out to be secretory carcinoma. The um, standby of adenocarcinoma NOS is getting smaller and smaller with every year. As we transition, they really are something that we are losing. And so here you can see 38% of those cases fit into secretory carcinoma. And then a variety of other ductile-derived tumors, such as cystadenocarcinoma and mucoab, were where these particular tumors arise from. So um, by definition, it's a low-grade salivary gland tumor characterized by resemblance to its mammary counterpart um, and of course is ETV6 associated uh, usually with an NTRAC gene fusion. So when you think about it though, secretory carcinoma is a tumor type that is well described in breast, in salivary gland, thyroid skin, GU system, etc. And so uh, this is why the term secretory carcinoma is now preferred over um, mammary analog secretory carcinoma, which was of course the original name. And you know, I uh, do poke a little bit of fun here at um, uh, my buddy Elena Scalova, because if you take Mrs. Elena Scalova carcinoma, of course you get mask, which is the original name for it. And this is not her naming for it at all. This is just me having fun with it, but um, I thought it's a nice way to actually remember the tumor type. 
So if you think about it, it is something that when you looked at looked like a cynic cell carcinoma but didn't really have us in the differentiation. And so um, middle aged, uh, broad age range, slightly more common in male patients. Of course, the major salivary glands is the most common location uh, since a cynic was one of the uh, areas where this tumor was um, pulled out of, you can tell that that would be a major salivary gland location as well. So it is a nondescript finding on imaging. You can see that it's a bright signal here um, telling you that there is a mass there, but it doesn't give you any other information. Fine needle, of course, highly cellular, um, fragments and loose clusters of tissue, um, mild to moderate nuclear pleomorphism, and of course, this abundant um, cytoplasm that often has uh, vacuolation or even multivacuolation um, as part of the secretory product. And it's important to recognize that mucinous um, and granular eosinophilic debris can actually be seen in this particular tumor, although generally there's no ductal or acina differentiation because, of course, that would take you into a different path. So here's just a sheet like distribution to the this particular tumor, you can tell that there are multiple fragments of tissue here. When you go on to higher power here with a different um, staining with the diff quick, you can tell again that there is kind of a secretory product or something present within the cytoplasm. Here, when you look at it on higher power, I think you can see that there are multiple vacuoles present and a finely um, delicate uh, cytoplasm with small vacuoles present within it as well. So, lobulated pushing border, uh, generally no capsule. Um, it will invade out into the adjacent parenchyma, however, and have perineal invasion in some of them. The microcystic to glandular appearance is seen in about 25%, papillary in 29%, solid and macrofollicular in about 17 So you can tell, again, this is a blending of different architectural patterns, quite similar to what you can see again in a cynic cell carcinoma. Um, eosinophilic homogeneous or bubbly secretory material that is present um, usually in the lumen. And so here you can tell uh, low power, it's a much more cystic appearance to the tumor. Um, you will notice multiple fibro connective tissue septa that divide out of the tumor. Here is the uninvolved parenchyma in the adjacent side, and yet here is the invasive tumor. And I think you can all tell multiple cystic spaces here that are filled with kind of this bubbly secretory type material. Again, there is a fibro uh, septa that is separating it out here, but multiple different, both uh, kind of large cystic spaces, almost a column type space and then kind of a papillary architecture present in some areas as well with a more degenerated appearance in others. So really there is a remarkable variability in how the tumor presents. This is one where really the idea of are you dealing with a thyroid tumor certainly comes to mind. I mean, that very eosinophilic bright quality to the inspissated material looks very, very similar to colloid. And yet you can tell here that you are in a major salivary gland. And this is an example of a secretory carcinoma. When you look at it on higher power, there is, um, again, this fibrous connective tissue that separates it out into these various spaces. And I do look for that fibrous connective tissue. I find it to be quite helpful. Um, it is not exclusive to this tumor by any stretch but it definitely is easy to identify. And then you can again see the kind of bubbly cytoplasmic quality in the background. More of a hobnail appearance here to a papillary structure. Um, and I'm showing this again, just because I showed the papillary architecture for a cynic. And you can tell how here the papillary architecture is somewhat similar um, in this particular case. Histologically, vesicular uh, nuclei, so they're very open, um, although there's usually a very prominent centrally placed nucleolus, lots of cytoplasm usually vacuolated. Pleomorphism, necrosis, and mitoses are usually limited. However, when they're present, all of those things then put you into the high-grade transformation category. So just be aware that when you do have them, you need to be more worried about the idea that this could be a high-grade transformation. So here you will notice, again, very open uh, vesicular uh, nuclear chromatin. But again, very, very prominent nuclei are easy to identify in the vast majority of the nuclei. And then, of course, these very bubbly secretory type material in the background, lots of secretory material here, again, with the open nuclear chromatin. And then a final example where, in fact, there's even some inclusion of um, hemosiderin or hematoidin type pigment that has come into the cytoplasm of the neoplastic cells. This is just to show an area in which you do, in fact, have tumor necrosis. And this is one of the features that you would see once the tumor has begun to undergo a high-grade transformation. Dense fibrous connective tissue bands actually is very characteristic for this particular tumor and again is something that I do look for when I am reviewing this particular neoplasm. 
Well, um, lots of different immunohistochemistry studies have been um, applied to this particular tumor, and you can see that there are a whole lot that are both positive and then selected ones that are negative. Um, I do think, though, that if you're going to approach this from an immunophenotypic standpoint, the ones that are the most helpful is doing mammoglobin and S100, and in fact, having negative P63 or DOG1. So, those give you a nice positive of two different markers that are not really present in a variety of other tumors, although by caveat. Um, mammoglobin can be seen in some other tumors within the uh, salivary gland category, and of course, so can S100. Um, but it's a combination here of having both the mammoglobin and S100 being such a nice, strong, diffuse reaction that I'll show in a second, while the P63 and the DOG1 are both negative. So here you can see very strong and diffuse mammoglobin positivity throughout. Um, the S100 is a nice, strong reaction in all of the nuclei and cytoplasm. And then, of course, um, the P63 is negative in this particular case. I mean, you'll have isolated cells like this that are present at the basal region, but definitely the neoplastic cells are not positive in this particular circumstance. So by definition, um, there is a recurrent balanced uh, chromosomal translocation. So this is the ETB6 and NTREC um, fusion, giving you um, an identical finding to what you see in secretory breast carcinoma. And of course, the thing that's nice about this is the NTREC is known to be uh, part of a number of different clinical trials. So depending on where the patient is with um, stage and clinical recurrence or metastatic disease, they may be a candidate. Um, in that particular case, obviously, then the fusion should have been um, tested for or doing RT-PCR to make sure exactly which um, fusion partner is present. Um, but, you know, it is a very well accepted um, definitional component for it. I must say I don't do it on every case in order to confirm the diagnosis, but certainly if you do have an indication that this may be the tumor type, it's very easy to do this particular marker to confirm it with um, a nice positive break apart in this particular case. So when you think about the prognosis and predictive behavior for this particular tumor, um, about 25% will have lymph node mets, local recurrence about 20% distant uh, mets in about 2%, and then high-grade transformation in about 5%. So overall, still, there's an excellent overall outcome for these particular patients, although it is clearly clinical stage and high-grade transformation dependent. So, um, mammary analog secretory carcinoma, while we were sitting there at the World Health Organization meeting, um, faded away, and we all agreed to call it um, secretory carcinoma as the um, exclusive name for this particular tumor type. Just so you know, we do all go out in the evening and have fun, and here is um, Elena and Bruce and Nina and... Um, uh, and myself having a, a good time uh, in the evening. So even though we do argue and carry on during the meeting, we still all have um, a great time in the evening. Okay, so polymorphous adenocarcinoma is the next category. So this particular tumor um, used to have a designation of low-grade automatically. So you would say polymorphous low-grade adenocarcinoma. However, um, if you have a low-grade adenocarcinoma that has high-grade, then what do you say? Polymorphous low-grade adenocarcinoma high-grade variant? That just doesn't sound good. And if you have a lot of metastatic disease developed, then you don't really want to say a low-grade tumor that has a high-grade clinical appearance. So the, the nomenclature for these particular tumors where grade is part of it or the age of the patient is part of it. So juvenile angiofibroma, well, you know, if they occur in an adult, then it's not really a juvenile angiofibroma. So, you know, all of this was thought about um, very carefully to try and say, when we have a name for a lesion, let's just have the name of the lesion be it, not have any sort of other qualifiers in it. If you then want to apply a grade to it, you can say polymorphous adenocarcinoma, and it's the low grade or polymorphous adenocarcinoma intermediate grade, or cripiform type, or high grade. So this is the um, reason for it. As you know, it's a tumor that is almost exclusively in minor salivary glands. Um, in fact, it is my view that probably all of these do really develop in that location, although Mother Nature doesn't always agree with us, and there's always one or two cases that you can see in the literature where it has developed in a major salivary gland location. Um, more frequent in uh, women, and again, the palate is by far and away the most common location for this particular tumor. And um, when you think about um, the polymorphous adenocarcinoma category, it's the most second most common of the intraoral salivary gland tumors, generally circumscribed, but certainly not encapsulated. Um, 
The surface has a very interesting appearance, though, because it has this roughened or corrugated appearance. So here you will notice um, when you look at it on um, just a clinical view that there is this corrugation um, that appears on the palate where there's multiple little uh, furrows, if you will. And that particular pattern is actually quite um, specific and unique to the polymorphous adenocarcinoma category. And so when a clinician sees that and they are aware of that particular feature and finding, they will be able to give a fairly accurate prediction of what the histology is going to show for those patients. Usually an intact surface, prominent targetoid perineural infiltration invades out into the adjacent fat and kind of incarcerates the normal tissue. So it's just completely surrounded and looks just fine, even though it's completely surrounded by the tumor. And then, of course, there's very slate gray overall appearance to it. So here you can tell that there is um, a, a intact surface epithelium and then this kind of whirling or swirling. So sometimes this is used as um, a whirlwind or a hurricane. And I, I know that there are hurricanes going on at this particular time, but this is the perfect example in which to use it. And so I will point out this is Hurricane Lester. I, just, I, I know it's too much, really, but I could not believe it that long, a couple of years ago, one of my friends said, there's a hurricane in the Pacific and it has your name. And I'm like, oh, dear. at first it was a tropical storm. So, you know, it wasn't quite as exciting, but then it did actually turn into a hurricane. And when you look at it on high power, you can see that fabulous swirling. And this is exactly what you see with the tumor, this kind of swirling appearance. So it has this whirlwind type of center eye of the storm appearance that is just so classic for this particular tumor that it is something that you can see on low power and in fact it's a nerve that is present in that dead center and here you can see if you use an S100 you can actually highlight the nerve in the center with of course the tumor being positive for S100 as well swirling around around the entire lesion. This is an example of what I think of as good incarceration. So you will notice that the minor mucoceros glands are completely normal. They are just sitting there, and yet they are in, surrounded and infiltrated by the rest of the neoplasm. So unfortunately, depending on how you look at this, there are some people who will view this as mucinous differentiation in the tumor, and therefore they go down a different path of diagnosis, thinking, could this be a mucoepidermoid, or is there something else to consider? So I'm pointing this out because really it is not at all related to the tumor, it is just that the minor salivary gland tissue has been completely surrounded, and we use the term entombment or incarceration of the entire um, surrounding normal tissue. It's just sitting there, and it's not part of it at all. Slight gray background here, you can see that kind of bluish, um, almost mixoid or mucinous type appearance to it. It's not chondroid, it is a different appearance than what you see in pleomorphic adenoma, but clearly there is some morphologic resemblance to it as you're looking through the tumor and that kind of slate gray uh, matrix material is quite commonly identified. So as I've already suggested, a lot of different patterns of growth, hence the name of polymorphous. So lobules and nest and tubules, linear, single cell, that swirling or eye of the storm type appearance, but it's usually cytologically bland for the low-grade tumor category. So if you think about the original PLGA group, of which now polymorphous adenocarcinoma and low-grade would now qualify, this is where the cytologically bland appearance is with the open vesicular nuclear chromatin and kind of um, prominent nucleolus. So again, that swirling architectural appearance, mummification of the surrounding um, minor mucoceros glands, and again, this perineural invasion that is at the center of these world-type areas. Um, linear architectural arrangement as well is quite characteristic for this particular tumor as well, usually out towards the periphery. And then when you look at it, um, the chromatin is very open and uh, cleared out, very fine, stippled to even in its distribution, very small, but still easily identified nucleolus. So when I think about the differential and people will say to me, oh, is this an adenoid cystic carcinoma differential? And it really is not, because when you think about adenoid cystic, it's a hyperchromatic nucleus. It has a very angled and carrot or peg shaped appearance to it that I just don't see here. So when people use that particular consideration, I always just wonder, you know, the, the um, appearance of the nucleus is just so different from what you have in the rest of the um, category that I just don't think of it as being part of the differential. So 
Um, that was the polymorphous adenocarcinoma and specifically the low-grade category. Now you have polymorphous adenocarcinoma and the cribriform type. So this particular tumor, when you think about it, um, looks a bit morphologically like papillary thyroid carcinoma, meaning that there are papillary projections. It has the same nuclear chromatin distribution. Glomeruloid type bodies are present. But again, um, nearly 50% of the patients have lymph node metastasis at the time of presentation. So if you're going to call something polymorphous low-grade, as these tumors were originally recognized um, from, um, you can't have lymph node metastasis 50% of the time and call the tumor low grade. I mean, this is just oxymoronic and therefore cannot be included. And so when you think about it here now with more than 50% of these patients having lymph node met at presentation, it is very good to have excluded this particular tumor and moved it into a newer category. So it has an invasive periphery, this cribriform or microcribriform tubular or solid appearance, clefting, giving you a very nice glomeruloid um, type body, uh, uh, looks very similar to what you see in the kidney. And then, of course, some of bodies may be present as well with this very um, well-developed fibre receptor that divide the tumour out into um, lobules or nodules. Now, again, um, the nuclei to me do look quite similar. In other words, they have this open nuclear chromatin um, appearance very similar to the polymorphous adenocarcinoma that we usually recognize in the low-grade category. So here it is on low power. You'll notice that the surface epithelium is in fact intact and it's separated. But even at this power, I think you can see that there is some areas of degeneration and fibrous connective tissue, and it just looks much more cellular. You don't have that kind of very um, swirled overall appearance to it um, at this intermediate power. Bone invasion is seen in this particular case. Again, something that is generally not associated with a lower grade tumor category. Um, the glomeruloid or sieve-like appearance, um, very easy to identify here with a nice glomeruloid body here, another glomeruloid body there, perhaps another one present over here. Um, tumor necrosis present in these two places. Again, not something that you would expect to see in a low grade tumor. And I think you are able to recognize papillary structures present over here that um, again, may be forming part of the glomeruloid body, but the papillary structures are not something that you see um, in the polymorphous adenocarcinoma low-grade category. Somoma bodies can be seen in some of these tumors as well. And even at this uh, power, I think you can tell there is a remarkable similarity to what I just showed in the nuclear chromatin uh, distribution. Nice fibrous connective tissue septa present within this particular tumor as well with some hemorrhage present. And then very nice papillary structures that are easy to identify in this particular tumor with um, necro uh, mitotic figures that are often quite easy. But in general, you can identify mitotic figures without too much difficulty. Now, um, salivary duct carcinoma, I'm going to go over just for a few moments because, of course, one of the tumors have kind of, has been recognized out of this particular category. And so, uh, once again, like to show what the tumor is before you talk about what has been separately identified. So if you think about this, it's an aggressive malignancy histologically with an apocrine appearance and looks uh, quite similar to what you expect to see in breast adenocarcinoma. Although in this particular case, it is somewhat defined by this very, very strong and diffuse nuclear androgen receptor reactivity. The vast majority, again, develop in the parotid gland, much more common in men and tends to be much um, older age range at initial presentation. And probably the reason for this is um, salivary duct carcinoma actually represents the carcinoma category that you think about in the carcinoma expleomorphic adenoma. So, you know, this was um, presented recently in the Head and Neck Pathology Journal um, as an example of um, one of the first examples of salivary gland tumors. And so I thought I would put it in just as kind of a highlight to, um, there isn't really ever anything new. We just give it a new name or a new description, but um, there, there isn't anything new. So this is in the papal apartments. When you look at this particular painting on the wall and you'll say, what the devil does that have to do with salivary gland pathology? Okay. I am going to highlight this guy in the corner. And lo and behold, look at that. Here is his salivary gland tumor. It's a large mass in the parotid. And he's actually looking so that you're able to see it. I mean, he's not looking the other way to hide it. So he really genuinely wanted this to be part of the overall presentation. 
And so here we have um, a nice example of a salivary gland tumor, and this is the same thing when you look at it here now on imaging. So when you think about it here, this area of calcification actually represents the previous benign pleomorphic adenoma in this space, where now this area of degeneration is part of the tumor necrosis and transformation into the salivary duct carcinoma as part of a carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma. Um, usually they tend to be a much more rapid clinical presentation, and so you are going to have um, erythema or surface ulceration or cracking. Um, uh, this is obviously a huge tumor in this particular patient. Um, I must say I do tease the residents a little bit about saying you need to submit at least one section per centimeter of that tumor, and needless to say, this would be a boatload of different samples. So, unencapsulated, poorly circumscribed, lots of infiltration into the adjacent parenchyma, um, multinodularity with cysts and necrosis, um, fibrosis, and then, of course, as I've already suggested, um, a pleomorphic adenoma is often present in the background of a salivary duct carcinoma. So, here you can tell multiple different patterns. And in fact, in this particular case, if you look at this area, this is probably the area of the previous benign pleomorphic adenoma in that case. Lots of perineural invasion, lots of lymphovascular invasion, comedonecrosis, marked desmoplastic hyalinized fibrosis, and in fact, that area of hyalinization is actually more likely to represent the area of previous benign pleomorphic adenoma. And so when I look at these cases, I often will submit preferentially from those areas in order to be able to document it. And then, of course, there's very uh, variable size, round, solid cystic nodules that uh, resemble African carcinoma of the breast, sometimes arranged in a sort of papillary and cribriform appearance that give you a Roman bridge type architecture that is quite classical for this particular tumor. So here you can see an example. Um, in this particular case, here is the region of calcification and an area of benign pleomorphic adenoma. And I think all of you can tell this looks quite different from the rest of this. And that is all the example of the salivary duct carcinoma. Another example of a sclerotic and hyalinized nodule that represents the previous benign pleomorphic adenoma. And then over here you have the example of the salivary duct carcinoma as the carcinoma XPA category. Most of these tumors are widely invasive. So in this particular case, I think, again, you will be able to recognize easily that this is the benign pleomorphic adenoma. And then the rest of this is the example of the salivary duct carcinoma. And so if you're measuring out the distance of invasion, generally measuring from here to where it expands would be the measurement. And in this case, obviously, it's much more than 1.5 millimeters, which is the definition of a widely invasive tumor. I will say there's a lot of transition with this because of course, where do you measure from? Is it a linear arrangement? If the tumor has multiple nodules, where do you measure it to? If it's not encapsulated, you know, all of these types of things come into play. Just suffice it to say that they generally are very widely infiltrative tumors. This is a bit more of that um, Roman bridge type appearance with the comedonecrosis and calcifications easily identified. Central area of necrosis here with a very high grade neoplasm filling in the rest of the screen. Um, the very you know characteristic punched out um, appearance that you would have for something similar to you know a high grade DCIS or a tumor that is associated with DCIS in the breast um, and giving you that kind of Roman bridge type appearance here. Uh, lots of perineural invasion. So so here, actually, this is an entirely um, large nerve that is now filled with intra and perineural invasion by the neoplasm in this case. Um, often you will have uh, dense fibrous connective tissue that creates nodules out of the tumor. That's something that is quite characteristic and something that I actually look for um, when I'm trying to interpret one of these higher grade tumors. Again, you can see that there are areas of comedonecrosis easily identified in this space. And then multiple uh, tumor uh, nodules that have invaded out into the adjacent parenchyma. Here you can see the unremarkable parenchyma with a tumor invading out into it. Lots of um, pleomorphism, usually kind of a cuboidal, um, lots of amphiphilic uh, granular or oncocytic cytoplasm, which in essence is giving you that very nice apocrine morphology, and then of course prominent nucleoli and hyperchromasia. So here is a nice example of the cribriform appearance as an apocrine tumor type. Again, the apocrine tumor morphology is very easy to identify in this particular case, and really it is an apocrine tumor. And so you may say, um, is there ever any non-apocrine salivary duct carcinoma? And the answer is no. And so with this little gift that I created while I was at the beach, um, uh, trying to highlight that particular point. 
just for the record, this took about 70 takes to be able to get it so the water didn't wash away the entire diagnosis. But this is a minor point that we are not going to go to any further. So there are variants, um, sarcomatoid, micropapillary, mucin rich and osteoclastic giant cell. The, the latter is not really common at all, so I've kind of uh, diminished it here. But the others certainly can be seen where you have um, a spindle cell morphology or giving you more of a sarcomatous appearance with the rest of the epithelial um, nature easily identified. So it's a juxtaposition of those two particular components. Here you can see again a spindle cell morphology where there is um, not much of the epithelial component, although it is still obviously present in the background as it has transformed into a malignant spindle cell tumor. The micropapillary appearance, um, often quite characteristic um, for the tumor, although it is not usually the single pattern that you see, it's just one of the patterns, but when it is seen, um, it tends to have a, a little bit worse, worse prognosis for these patients. And then finally, the mucinous pattern as well is another one that is recognized where you have pools of mucinous material that surround the areas of the tumor and is quite similar to colloid carcinoma in other anatomic sites as well. So when you think about it, um, the presence of pleomorphic adenoma, right? So um, how much of the pleomorphic adenoma do you need in order to call it a carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma? Well, it's my view that if all you have is a very heavily sclerotic or hyalinized nodule, that probably is enough to be able to make that particular consideration. So there have been several studies that have reviewed this, and there is often molecular evidence of being either uh, PLAG1 uh, or HMGA2 present in the background, or you're able to see it histologically with viable tumor cells. So when you combine those two particular um, findings, in essence, um, about 70 or 80% of the tumors will be able to have a benign pleomorphic adenoma identified in the background. So as you can tell, there are a variety of different both activating mutations and amplifications of a variety of oncogenes, and then of course inactivating mutations or deletions of a variety of tumor suppressors, and depending upon what the ratio of these will determine what goes on with the tumor. And so it is for this reason, depending upon where you are in that particular pathway, why perhaps the HER2, which has been utilized by some people, may not be as applicable as others because, of course, if you have a, a mutation truncated before you get to that particular point, the fact that there is a HER2 expression may not mean that the patient will actually respond therapeutically. And so when you think about it, amplifications are usually only seen in the salivary duct carcinoma XPA cat category um, rather than in de novo salivary duct carcinomas. So when I look at this uh, immunophenotypically, there are, again, a number of different markers that can be present and positive in this particular tumor, along with um, pertinent negatives. And I think that the P63 CK56 is very helpful because high-grade salivary duct carcinoma as an entity often is um, included with high-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma as one of the differential considerations. And of course, that would be positive with the P63 or the CK56. So that is something where um, this particular uh, paradigm can be helpful in evaluating the tumors. So the single most important thing for me is the androgen receptor in this particular case. So let's look at a few. Here you can see very strong CK pan. Here is a CK7. Uh, this happens to be done on a um, sarcomatoid variant, and you can see that the sarcomatoid area does not really pick up the epithelial marker. But, you know, the androgen receptor actually was originally ordered uh, by mistake by one of Dr. Barnes's fellows when they were doing um, ER and PR, and they just did um, all three by accident. And this is how it came to be learned that um, it is a very strong androgen receptor positive tumor, and more than 98% of the tumors, in fact, are positive for this particular marker. And if they're not, you probably shouldn't consider this particular tumor. Now, of course, there are always some exceptions. The basal-like uh, morphology in the uh, mucin-rich area tends not to react as strongly, but of course, other areas of the tumor would probably be reactive. And so here you can see an example of the androgen receptor, where it really is a very, if you use the all-red scoring system, nearly all of the nuclei are positive, and nearly all of them have a strong diffuse reaction. So it really is a very high all red score if you look at the scoring methodology for androgen receptor positivity. Here I'm just including a HER2 because of course everyone always talks about it and the clinicians want to do it and so forth, but you do need to make sure that you have explained to them why a positive result does not mean that the patient is going to respond, even if they have um, amplification as identified with a FISH technique. So it, it is something where you really need to have a very uh, careful consideration about what it is that you're doing and why you're doing something 
anything. Because just because the marker is positive or just because you have a fish does not need to say that the patient is actually going to respond to um, therapeutic intervention. Showing just the P63, you can tell there are isolated cells present, but the vast majority of the tumor is not reactive. And same thing with CK56, as you consider this within the differential diagnostic consideration. Sometimes P53 can be a value. Um, I, I don't do it very often, um, but you know, if I'm struggling with a case and trying to figure out, you know, is the PA or not, um, here you will notice the pleomorphic adenoma in the lower side and the salivary duct carcinoma in the upper side, and you can see how the PA really does not have any P53, while it is strongly overexpressed in the salivary duct carcinoma. So in some instances, if there is some difficulty in interpretation or trying to get a feel of how much of the tumor actually may be part of the malignancy, this is a good area in which to do it. So aggressive multimodality therapy is required with surgery, radiation, and androgen deprivation therapy or other chemotherapies. But unfortunately, still, there is usually a very poor overall outcome for these particular patients. Um, with the prognostic um, criteria listed here, the grade and stage extent of invasion, proportion of tumor, large size, proliferation index, histology, subtype, and margin. And of course, depending upon which and what parameter is actually present, would determine the overall outcome for these particular patients. Um, I'm just giving a plug here for a moment for the ICCR. This is one of the um, uh, organizations globally that does standardized reporting, and the carcinomas of the major salivary gland histopathology reporting guide has been um, released as of uh, last week. So, in fact, this is brand new information. But if you want to go to their particular site, which is ICCR-cancer.org, you would definitely be able to look at all of the data sets that they have for all of the various um, head and neck locations. Of course, they have them for other anatomic sites too, but the salivary gland is a nice one to include in this particular example. So when you think about salivary duct carcinoma, one of the things in the differential, of course, is also introductal carcinoma. And so this is one of the new entities that was included in the book, and so I've incorporated it here as the last topic to discuss, and that is it's an introductal salivary gland neoplasm, giving a nice intracystic appearance that really resembles low-grade uh, ductal carcinoma in situ of the breast. So again, a slightly older age range, uh, women a little bit more often than men and tends to be involved in the major salivary glands, well circumscribed, multiple cystic spaces with this introductal epithelial proliferation, papillary and micropapillary projections, multi-layered, nice apocrine snouts, very similar in essence to some of the appearances that you can have with the salivary duct carcinoma, except it is um, a low-grade lesion. But since salivary duct carcinoma, by definition, is a high-grade tumor, this, again, to try and say um, a low-grade salivary duct carcinoma is oxymoronic, and so having introductal carcinoma as a category removes that from consideration. And so also, it is, by definition, surrounded by a myoepithelial layer that is intact, and so there is not evidence of invasion. So here you will notice nice um, fibroceptor separating it out with these large cystic spaces lined by epithelium. Um, multiple layers of epithelium can be seen quite frequently with this very uh, cribriform type appearance. In fact, they do look um, a bit similar to either intraductal hyperplasia, atypical ductal hyperplasia, or low-grade DCIS. Any one of those three particular categories can all be seen in this particular tumor as you will notice from here. And so sometimes people say, well, you know, what are Roman bridges? So this is a Roman bridge taken near um, France. Um, Avignon, I think, is where I took this particular photo. And so if you tilt it ever so slightly on side and then look in the back, and this is exactly what you're seeing with the Roman bridges in this particular case. I'll put it back for a second for those who missed that. But there you can see the exact same concept. And then when you look at it, you can see these nice uh, sort of punched out Roman bridge type appearance that will, in fact, have a very nice intact myoepithelial layer that can be highlighted by a variety of um, basal markers. I happen to be showing the P63 here, but clearly others would be um, helpful as well. And so if you think about it, either P63 or calponin, even CK56, would be continuous in the myoepithelial rim around the periphery, whereas the luminal cells are strongly positive for S100 um, and uh, will be positive as well with androgen receptors. So that's one of the reasons why uh, there was confusion initially with the idea of salivary duct carcinoma. And so here you can see an example now with smooth muscle, smooth muscle actin highlighting the periphery of this particular tumor where the tumor is in fact negative, and then a strong reaction with um, S100 of all of the neoplastic cells with androgen receptor also positive in that particular case.
And so you have now just had a whirlwind tour of all of the uh, newer entities within salivary gland pathology, and uh, you now have the World Health Organization classification of salivary gland tumors with a nice image here of secretory carcinoma of the globe. I'm very happy to um, answer any questions at this particular juncture, and hopefully we'll be able to um, do so if they are showing up um, online. I do think that they um, pop up in the chat section, although, Emilio, if you want to send them over to me, if I'm not seeing them for any reason, I'm happy to try and answer any at this point. Sure. Thank you very much, Dr. Thompson, for taking the time to update the international community on these uh, the new WHO classifications of, of the salivary gland. I do see a couple of questions in uh, YouTube and Facebook. I don't know if you're if you're seeing the uh, the Facebook chat. But... I don't actually. Yeah, I don't actually see any on the Facebook at this moment. But maybe okay. it's because I'm looking just at the go to meeting. So okay. let me. So yeah, somebody uh, somebody had just uh, they asked uh, what what your thoughts are on the role of uh, FNA when excision is the only option. Hmm. So, um, and of course the question has already been stated, so I won't repeat it, but I do think that um, surgical planning um, is important. So if you consider um, superficial parotidectomy versus total parotidectomy, um, the increased risk to the uh, facial nerve in that particular space is obviously important. And so if you have fine needle aspiration first, you'll know, yes, I'm dealing with a benign tumor or I'm dealing with a malignant tumor. Um, if you get out a malignant tumor and you see that there's tumor necrosis and lots of mitotic activity, then perhaps the grade of the tumor is also going to be taken into consideration as they do their surgical planning um, for these particular lesions. So I do think the surgical planning is a significant role. Um, also, depending on the age of the patient and their clinical st uh, status, let's use um, Warfarin tumor just as an example. You know, this is a benign thing. It's not really going to bother the people. Um, watchful waiting may be an option for someone who's in their um, 80s or 90s and doesn't want to go through the surgical um, uh, alteration. So I think uh, there are times when it is going to be of value to know exactly uh, what type of tumor it is uh, before the rest of the therapeutic options are done. Okay, excellent. Um, one of the viewers on YouTube asked, uh, you know, what would be your approach to differentiate polymorphous adenocarcinoma, cribriform type, and, and anocystic carcinoma? What's your approach? Yeah, so, you know, unfortunately, um, many of these tumors have remarkable um, overlapping um, histology. In other words, if you think about um, the histology appearance, they can have uh, a similar finding. Uh, although, again, for me, adenoid cystic is a much more hyperchromatic nuclear um, appearance than what you have for um, a polymorphous adenocarcinoma cribriform type. So they really are going to be a different pattern. So that, I think, just histologically, you would be able to make that particular separation. Now, as far as um, immunophenotypic expression, in general, um, it is a single population versus a dual population. Right. So if I can use adenoid cystic um, as a first example, they are actually going to be um, both myoepithelial as well as epithelial components to it. So there will be a dual separation of the immunophenotypic findings that you have in that particular tumor. Whereas if you think about the polymorphous adenocarcinoma, it's a single population. So if you were to do something like S100 as an example, um, the S100 is going to stain all of the tumors. Uh, tumor cells in a polymorphous adenocarcinoma, whereas in an adenoid cystic carcinoma, it will only highlight a subpopulation of them. So I think that when you do the various markers, the identification of just a single uniform population of cells for the polymorphous adenocarcinoma category versus adenoid cystic being a myoepithelial and epithelial um, compartment. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. And I see another question here. They, uh, someone mentioned that it's been suggested that the nuclei of polymorphous adenocarcinoma are very similar to the nuclei of, of PTC. And they just want to know if you agree with that or not. Um, yes, definitely I do. I, I think that um, papillary thyroid carcinoma nuclei being open, uh, vesicular nuclear chromatin um, marginated out towards the periphery with accentuation of the membrane is definitely the case. And of course, the papillary architecture can also be seen in polymorphous adenocarcinoma cribriform type. So it definitely can be a morphologic overlap. I will say, though, that um, 
nucleoli-wise, um, you can have a very small nucleolus present on the membrane, preferentially in papillary thyroid carcinoma, but it tends to be a much more prominent and easily identified one um, when you see it in the polymorphous adenocarcinoma category. So um, I think there are some similarities, although there may be some slight differences as well. Now, you know, if you're going to do immuno, obviously thyroglobulin would be a separator in that particular case, since that would help you without any problem. Right. Okay. All right. So I don't see any more questions right now here on <clears throat> Facebook or YouTube. And, but, you know, as uh, the que sometimes they, they can po uh, some of the questions could be posted after the lecture since I'd see someone did ask if this lecture was going to be available on YouTube and, and it will be it'll be on YouTube and on and on Facebook as well so I just want to say thank you to you Dr. Thompson for the lecture and again congratulations to you and the rest of the ICCR group for creating an international standard for reporting cancer I think that's very important work and so that's Thanks. Yeah, no, I think it's a very good opportunity, and especially for those who are not part of an already organized group like the CAP or the ASCP that do have some reporting standards um, that, you know, are based in a country. This is an example where you can use it internationally without having to necessarily um, subscribe to a service. You're just able to have a standardized methodology of reporting the results um, that you can use regionally. And of course, you know, you can tweak as you need for your local um, distribution. Excellent. Thanks very much. Absolutely. And I, just, I, I wanted to mention that thanks for pointing out that uh, salivary duct carcinoma in, the, in Raphael's School of Athens. I will, I always saw School of Athens as uh, it always, it always, uh, I would always focus on the right side because of the Guns N' Roses uh, "Use Your Illusion" cover <laughs> of the of the reader of the sorry the person that's writing. But now I'm going to be focusing on the left side and. And I looked it up on Google, and yeah, it's there. You can see it from very far away. Just never noticed it. So, <laughs> yes, I, I don't think it's the very first example of a salivary gland tumor in art, because whenever you say that, someone is going to find something oh, that absolutely. is earlier. But um, it probably is close to it. <laughs> but thank you for that. So, um, as as always, you know, the lecture is going to be available on Facebook and YouTube. And you know, thank you again, Dr. Thompson, and thank you for everyone who joined. Hope you enjoyed today's session. And until next time. Take care. Bye-bye.